Hey, Peppin. Yo, yo. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about um, joysticks. J- joysticks? Ooh, I like where this is going. Yeah, you know how, like, so there was one, and then there was zero, and then one, and then two? Nope. You know, like Atari, you just it was just like one big joystick, and then you didn't have any joysticks anymore, and now we have two. I guess I guess that's true. You're talking about like modern technology with the PlayStation One. Yeah, absolutely. Like the the PS One or the Xbox One or <laughs> any of the ones. <laughs> any of the ones. Yes, yes. I I definitely know what you're talking about. You know, I've also been thinking about um, other technologies with video games, like VR. Oh, that's a good one. I didn't even think of that. Well, it's like the coming up technology. It's going to be, it puts you right into the game. Like, I heard there's VR porn out there. It's going to be great. V- Nate, we need to talk. Welcome back. So glad you guys could join us. I am here once again with my best friend, Nathan Pepin. How's it going, Pepin? Yo, yo, doing well. How about yourself, Steve? Not too bad. Thank you very much for asking. We are joined by two guests here today. I'm going to introduce a great friend of the show. He's been on the show before, uh, back on one of the Halloween specials. Uh, One of my best friends ever from college, Nick Stewart. How's it going, Nick? Uh, it's doing great. It's, uh, great to be back here because I know it's been quite a while since I've been on the show. It's probably been close to a year now. It has. It has. You're a one time a year special. Yeah, I'm, I'm a one hit wonder. Uh, well, that's, how they, remember, that's no, how they remember me. No, I didn't say that, but maybe everybody else did. I don't know. We'll check the Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> we also have with us here today a very special guest, another, a fellow podcaster on podcastnh.com, host of the Blaze Experience, a video game show. Derek, how's it going, Derek? Doing good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, I'm glad that you decided to, to come on the show. Um, you just joined the network fairly recently, but you have a pretty established community yourself. Tell me a little bit about your show. Yeah, basically I do a video game podcast, like you said, and essentially I take a game and I break down the strategy of that game or the mechanics of the game. So, for example, I've been talking a lot about State of Decay 2 lately, and I break down some of the mechanics of that game and just kind of help the community out. Absolutely, and I've listened to several episodes. I play a lot of Sea of Thieves myself. And Definitely, your of, I did a lot of that. You did, and your Sea of Thieves episodes have all been really helpful, and I love how you guys were talking about, uh, at one point you were talking about a new thing coming on, and it, it was the Megalodon, the Hungering Deep, and you act, guys actually predicted that it was going to be a Megalodon. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> we did, yes. Now, I've had some great guests in the past, and you know we always try to talk about what's going to be coming next, and I think it's nice to speculate like that. Absolutely, and you guys are, are damn good at it. You recently had an episode about State of Decay 2 um, where you're ta- you were ranking the different vehicles in it, and I think that's going to be a really helpful thing too. Talking about um, about Sea of Thieves, that game was produced by Rare, and I know Nick Stewart and I have played a ton of Rare games together. Is Rare your favorite video game company? I got to say, in the 90s, Rare was untouchable. The only person that made better games than Rare was Nintendo, and a lot of times they were making games together. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been playing a lot of Rare games since the Microsoft bought them out. I liked Viva Pinata. That was a great game that Rare made, but I feel like a lot of the team kind of fell out and left and went on to their own thing now. So I was very interested when I saw Sea of Thieves because everyone's like, oh my God, Rare's back. And having not played it, I guess I got to listen to you two and figure out how wonderful it is. But apparently from what Steve's been saying, he's been playing a lot, so it must be good. They just released, uh, I think, Banjo-Kazooie for the Xbox. They like remastered it. Uh, do you know anything about that, Derek? I didn't hear about that, but I did actually hear that in Sea of Thieves, there's going to be a Banjo-Kazooie figurehead at some point, oh. so that'll be interesting. Well, there, there should be. Yes. There should be, because <laughs> I hate Banjo. I think it's an awful game. But well, you're, I know, you're dumb. But I know Nick Stewart loves it. I also think that 007 GoldenEye is one of the worst shooters ever made. Uh, I think it was important for its time, but it doesn't hold up, and today it's unplayable. And I that's a very unpopular opinion. I, I never played the game, but I started getting into like, speedrunning, like, just watching it. And that's one of the big games people play, and I thought the game was going to be awesome looking, and I see it, and it's like, uh, this seems like dated, kind of sucks. Put your glasses on, Nate. It looks beautiful. Have you yeah, seen you Natalia? Your, Have you seen her? You got your nostalgia <laughs> glasses on. No, they're, they're always on. <laughs> I got nostalgia LASIK surgery last year. When's the last time you played 007 GoldenEye? 
Actually, not too long ago. I beat it earlier this year. Yeah, I yeah. was playing it on Double O Agent all the way through, and then I got to Aztec, and I said, nope. Because <laughs> that's when Jaws shows up, and he's got two lasers. Yeah, he's he's brutal. What about you, Darren? I haven't played that in years. I mean, it's... How do you, it's how do you remember like 10 years, game? probably. Um, I just remember it, you know, the graphics obviously not being up to today's standards, yeah. of course, yeah. but that's I definitely remember it as a great experience at the time, and... I know with the current Battle Royale tactics, there was like actually a way you could do last man standing in that game, which is kind of fun. So it's kind of a precursor to Battle Royale, I think. Oh, fair enough. I, I would have never thought of that comparison. One of the funny things about that game, bringing up the multiplayer, is that multiplayer was originally not supposed to be in GoldenEye at all. It was a, they kind of stuck it in the developers did without Nintendo knowing, and that ended up being one of the best parts of the game and the reason why it sold so well. And it's kind of funny to think that a little Easter egg per se ended up being one of the best parts. Absolutely. I, I know that that was always the draw. That was the only way I would play that game is in an actual like head-to-head version where you use the landmines in the bathroom and blow people out of the literally out of the water. I that, spent so much time blowing all the light bulbs up in those levels for no reason, <laughs> just because you could. But the, the controls not? just don't hold up today when you have twin-stick shooters that you a single joystick does not do justice and tank controls does not do justice for a shooter. I mean, this is going to get a little contentious here, but I don't think shooters are very good with joysticks in general. I mean, mm-hmm. but, you know, mouse and keyboard. All right, listen, Master <laughs> Race PC over here. I'm on that boat too now, so Master Race, woo! You're, you're not wrong. <laughs> shooters are better with, with mice. Derek, yes, thoughts on it, that? Okay, It definitely is. I mean, but. I don't play on PC myself, but anyone that plays on PC definitely has an advantage in a shooter, mm-hmm. so it, it does suck when they cross platforms kind of like Sea of Thieves has, you know, games like that. At least Sea of Thieves bounces it more, but any true shooter, if you're playing on PC, you're going to just naturally be better at it. Absolutely. But but having a single joystick and tank controls, the only thing that saves the game is auto-aim. And if your game is only playable because the computer aims for you, that's shit. Okay, that's because of limitations. And let me say, it's not just a single joystick. If you can master strafing, you have the C buttons that can move you left, right, up, and down. So it almost acts like you got two inputs you can look and you can steer with two different inputs no no that's a very fair point don't you have to aim with r1 though if you want to be more accurate yes but if you hit up or down on c buttons you can put your body up and down then you had that little bit of auto aim where your person will direct a little you know, little bit of auto there's aim. not that much steve <laughs> it's, it's you go, go play that game <laughs> so we're talking a lot about past video games. i want to know what everybody's favorite game is and that's a loaded question and tomorrow it may be a completely different answer but I want to, without having prompted you guys beforehand to think about it, tell me what's your favorite game of all time that you played. And if you need to give two, I'll, I'll give you two, but they can't be on the same system. The Witcher 3. Oh, that's recent. Yep. It's uh, pretty easy for me. Who, I mean, who produces that? Uh, CD Projekt Fred. And oh, awesome. They'll be coming out with Cyberpunk. I think it's a 2099. I, can't, I don't know what yep, the year, yep. but, but some Cyberpunk game. But uh, The Witcher 3, it was very, very story-driven. And I got super into the world. Like, I was reading the book. So, like, I read uh, the Witcher series comes from a book or a series of books that come from Poland. And CD Projekt Red just started making the games. First game, it was, like, good, but it kind of sucked in a way. It was, like, very retro-y. But it, it, the story was really good. Second game, the story was even better, more political. Uh, third game, the story is a bit dumbed down in some areas, but it's also more vast than others. It's much it's dumbed down as far as the politics go, but it's a lot more personal relationships, and mm-hmm. it's just really, really good, really touching moments, really awesome. Uh, gameplay, it's not as good, but it's it's my favorite game, definitely, of all time. Awesome, awesome. Do you have a runner-up? Uh, runner-up, uh, that's kind of tough. Maybe the game you've spent the most time on would be a good a good second one to say. Uh, you know, I'm going to say uh, Morrowind. Okay. Uh, Elder Scrolls 3 So Morrowind. you like RPGs. I like strategy games a lot too, but it's hard to give a strategy game to it. Like, mm-hmm. I played a lot of Civilization Five, mm-hmm. and that game I got pretty into. A lot of uh, uh, Age of Empire, Age of Empires, uh, Age of Wonders Three, a uh, bunch of strategy games. But it, it's hard to give it to them because there's not so much of a story element to it. There's not. It's like, it, it's fun, addictive. It's like get really into it, but it's not also like. Uh, you're not captivated by it. So for you personally, there's an extra added experience to having a story that's involved in it that you don't get yourself from a um, a, a strategy game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe one exception. To, it's a game I'm playing right now. I can't. I'm not finished with it. But it's called Divinity: Original Sin 2, and it's got like a, a lot of strategy to it. It's also a RPG, 
And it's got a decent story, I'd say. I mean, the story isn't, like, the main thing about the game. I, th I think I enjoyed the fighting more than I enjoyed the story. But it's still a pretty good game, so may maybe that's a combination. But, yeah, it's, it's not my favorite game of all time, though. All right, fair enough. not yet. The Witcher 3 by CD Projekt Red is Nathan Pepin's vote for number one game ever. Nick Stewart. Nick Stewart. This is a hard one because I don't know if I have a favorite. What game have you spent the most time playing? At least recorded time because I don't know because my N64 doesn't have a timer. But on Steam, it is Team Fortress 2. I have about 14,000 hours on it. And I've been... Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. 14,000? Okay, let me... Let me no, no, no. 1,400. There we go. 1,400. Okay, I've only spent 17 years playing the game. Yeah. No, okay, so 1,400 hours on that game. But I also used to play it on the Xbox 360 when the Orange Box came out. I so on top of that, on yeah, top of that, whatever. Yeah. I I didn't put too much into that one. Maybe another couple hundred, but that's so the game I played you were, the most. Let's say you were to estimate and include the N sixty four based on your personal estimate estimate. Um, you know, and this I'm assuming is when you were a kid and had a lot more time. No, this is when I was in college hanging out with you. No, wait, wait. <laughs> we I played think... Smash Bros every day. That game probably has like nine million hours we on it. We did play a lot of Smash Brothers. Okay, okay. So either Super Smash Brothers sixty four. Or Team Fortress, Team 2. Fortress 2. Okay, what's your favorite game? See, that that's hard. I don't know if I have a favorite. I have a favorite console, which is the N64, but, I mean, one of my favorite games right now might be Civ V. Pepin kind of brought that up. I've, I put about 800 hours into that one, and I just really like those city-building games. There's a new game called They Are Billions, where it's kind of like a tower defense against zombies, and that's really fun. But any of those kind of strategy, build your city, you know, run your government, run your economy, those I find quite enjoyable. Mm. Okay. All right. I love that. And who does uh, who does Civilization? Oh, what? It's a half. It's not Havoc, is it? Uh, Firaxis. Firaxis. Sid there we go. Awesome. Awesome. Sid Meier does that, Steve. <laughs> Sid. Sorry, Sid Meier. Um, and uh, who does um, whatever the other one was? There are billions. That's a. It's like mammoth games. Their logo is like the a horse from the the siege horse they used way back. All right, when just the, type in a horse siege logo into Google. I think it's. I think it'll get you a genius. <laughs> So uh, pretty sure it's Mammoth Games. I, I think. Derek, what game have you spent the most time on? Most time, it's kind of hard for me to say because I have kind of an eclectic taste where I move around a lot with games. So, what would it be better apt to say? What have you spent? What has given you the best time? I would say the best time is probably what I was going to say is my favorite game, okay. which is The Walking Dead by Telltale Games. Yep, yep. I just love the original season of that. It has a lot of emotion in it, a lot of story, and I honestly like a lot of games like that, that you can make your own story or choose your own adventure, sort of. And I know Pep mentioned this uh, series as well. I definitely love Skyrim a lot, which was uh, the fifth game for that series. And I love Skyrim because you can actually make your own story. You can choose your own side quest. If you don't like a certain faction in that game, you don't have to do their quest. I mean, I know in that one, I was the Thieves Guild, and I didn't like the Brotherhood, so I just went and killed them all. So <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of fun, actually. <laughs> fair, fair. So um, so what uh, what was the first one you mentioned? Uh, Telltale Games. Telltale Games yeah, yeah. Yes, The Walking Dead. So I the first my first experience with that game was I watched a pretty unknown YouTuber named Silent Tiger do a playthrough of that. And, like, at the end, when, uh, and the spoilers, I'm going to give you a second, jump ahead, two minutes. At the end, when, when Lee gets bitten, like, he started crying. And, like, you couldn't hear him crying, but you, like, very lightly could. And, like, that hit me way, like, even deeper. Like, the story itself was amazing. And then, on top of it, to watch this YouTuber who was pretty quiet throughout the whole thing. Like, just, like, start breaking down himself. Like, I had such a strong connection with that. I thought it was amazing. And, and it is amazing storytelling. Definitely. And it really shocked me when he got bit, too, because you wouldn't think, oh, your main character is going to get bit and die and mm -hmm. end the game. Like, that's not something you're going to expect. And I know a lot of things um, in that game are fun to watch reactions to. One of the best reaction videos I watched for that game is early on in the story. There's a character named Lily, and she shoots Carly. And everyone's like, what? I can't believe she just shot her. So mm -hmm. that was definitely a fun thing to watch reactions for. And I know it definitely shocked me at the time. Absolutely. 
there's actually a game I had Steve try. It was like a horror game. Uh, I've seen reactions to it, and that's why I wanted like Steve to play it. I uh, also had my other friend, but uh, remember that? It was the Silent Hill trailer? PT. PT, yeah. And that one was pretty like fucked up. Yeah, that one was awesome. Yeah, but uh, sp- speaking of awesome games, what is your favorite game? I remember when we were playing PT, you... Like, you were like, oh, yeah, this isn't that scary. And then we handed you the controller, and all of a sudden, like, you were like, ah, now I feel scared all of a sudden. Like, what, what is it about controlling it that made it change in your head? I don't know, because it's weird, because I saw other people play the game. I, and I didn't see the whole, like, playthrough, but I knew that, uh, you know, I could maybe watch some other people play it. And I knew some of the stuff to do, so it's like, watching you guys was fine. But, yeah, so, as soon as I handed the controller, it's just, like, peeking around the corners, like, fuck. I'm gonna die here. <laughs> fuck. That's the thing fuck, fuck. I love about horror games. Like I love horror movies, and I thought it was great, and that really scared me. But with a horror game, it really connects you. It makes it ex- it's an extension on yourself. So when you're playing a horror game and you're actually like sneaking around the corner, you're more concerned about yourself rather than you know sitting there watching Steve. It's completely different because you're disconnected at that point if you're not playing. Yeah, I think it's similar to with other games too. Like um, like with other games, if you're watching someone else play, you can understand like the meta narrative going on. Like they need to do this, this, and that because this is what the plot's calling for. And you know they can break those rules and such. But it's it's like uh, there's times when I was playing The Witcher Three where it, it's like I felt like everything was on the line. It's like oh no, they could kill this character, blah 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 blah. But if I was watching someone else play that, it would be like no, that that wouldn't make sense from a plot perspective. Like you get enthralled in that plot, and you you kind of feel like you are that character in some way. And then you die of dysentery. Uh yes, I think that's I think it's a different game. So Steve, back to you. That's what is your favorite trail, right? game y- yes, or most played? Don't um, avoid it. My my favorite game of all time is uh, Legend of Zelda: a Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo. That game is is amazing. It's it's got a. I mean, story is never, or at least didn't used to be the biggest aspect of it of a Zelda game. It was about the adventure, and that's what he wanted when he created it in the first place. And I think that they just, like, they nailed it so much with that game. It's like you go through a whole game, and then you go to the Dark World, and another entire game opens up on the same map. It flips the map, and now it's a completely different game that you're playing on the same exact map. And I think it just added so much depth, and it pushed the Super Nintendo in a lot of different ways. To It, it utilized it very well, where a lot of other games didn't. You have, like, ports of arcade games, and you're like, okay, or, or like old Atari games, I mean. And you're like, okay, like, yeah, this is anybody could do this, but to to push things to a new level, I think that game did really well. I think the most time in one sitting I ever played was Batman Arkham City. I played oh. that for twenty six hours straight when I was wow. there. A break. Oh, I was there. I, we were in college <laughs> and Steve was playing Batman and whatever, he played all night. I went to classes, came back, Steve was still playing, so I assumed he went to class. He kept playing all night and I woke up the next day and I'm like, Steve, have you beaten the game yet? He's like, Yeah, I beat it three times. I'm like, Oh, how did you do that with class? He's like, I haven't been to class in two days. <laughs> I didn't I didn't have class. That's that's right. You, you, that's right. It was like finals or yeah. something, so you were done with classes. It was it was right during a time. And I think we you shot like a video for one of your classes in the middle of it. I did, and you were still playing. And it was part of the video is me playing it because I didn't want to stop. Um so I think as far as like a straight through goes, that's probably the most time I've ever dumped into a game. Uh, I know I played like 700-something hours of Counter-Strike Source. I played that when I was in um, high school and into college quite a bit. Yeah, we were both very into that game. Yeah. I, it's, I would say it's one of my favorite games, but it's 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 more like, like a, how, do you, how do you say, like that Tetris game? It's kind of like Tetris. Like you don't enjoy Tetris that much, but it's addictive. You keep playing. You keep wanting to shoot people in the face. Boom, headshot. Boom, headshot. It's great. You play a weird Tetris. I love Tetris. I, I think Tetris is a lot of fun. And you, there's a there's actually a Tetris game for the PlayStation. Uh, I can't think of what it's called, but um, there's like a little guy, and you have to try and get him to drop down to the bottom. So it's not necessarily just about clearing the whole screen. It's about clearing certain lines to get him where you need to go. And my mom and I used to play that competitively back and forth, and like we had a lot of fun doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think like adding a co-op element to puzzle games at like adds a lot to a puzzle game, especially like a, a classic Tetris or something. I mean, for me, tet- playing Tetris is kind of like masturbation. Like it's fun to do, but you hit yourself after. Man, you got a cynical what look on masturbation. What do you watch for porn? <laughs> Where you're like, I really, I should really stop watching this goat stuff. It's well, getting weird. There's four squares, and they combine into different shapes, and they slip yeah, into what holes. What kind of Tetris are you playing? What kind of porn are you watching? <laughs> yeah. me? They cross over somewhere on there. It's Tetris porn. You're just watching blocks bang. 
Hey, Peppin. Yo, yo. Do you usually subscribe to entire podcasts, or do you look for specific topics? Well, I try using the search function on my podcast player on my phone. It doesn't work too well. I try using Google. Google, it's not really set up for it, so I honestly have trouble. Why don't you just use Listen Notes? Listen Notes? What's that? It's a search engine for podcasts that doesn't just search for the terms you're looking for in the title of the episode or the title of the podcast, but from inside the episode itself. Meaning if you're looking for a specific topic, you can find specific podcast episodes that are about that topic. You know, that sounds a lot easier than spending the hours and hours I have just trying to find the exact right keywords to actually get it to bring up the episode. I mean, usually I just get like a million uh, how to start your own podcast articles. It's really annoying. So that sounds a lot better. Exactly. When you're looking for something to listen to, just go to listennotes.com, type in a topic you're interested in, and you'll get instant gratification, useful results. That's listennotes.com. Check it out now. Has anyone played a VR game? I have not yet. <sighs> nope. No. I, I, I keep hearing about it. It sounds like it's really amazing. People feel like they're really there. And it's something I really want to try. Like... So this this gets towards what I wanted to, to head towards here. Um, now that we have the, the opening feel of what type of games people like, Nick mentioned horror games, and I think VR is like the prime show for Yes, horror. I can see that for sure. I think it that the horror genre will benefit the most from VR. Um, and maybe like the 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 simulation genre. YouTube's going gonna get forward. tons of grammar reaction videos too, so it's win win for everybody. Absolutely. So I think that that there's you know we were talking about how when when you're controlling the character yourself, it adds a different element to playing a horror game. And I think a good story adds a lot to a horror game in the same way that Nate was saying, like a, a strategy game doesn't hit as close to him because the story matters so much more. A telltale game, that's what they're that's all they are. Yeah, it's, it's a just story. story. It's just a story that you click you do quick time events sometimes for. So like it's I think along those same lines, like horror lends itself to telling good story and I think that graphics and can the continuation of VR are going to change the horror genre more than any other genre. Because now it's not just, you know, you you controlling it being more scary than watching it, but being in it. You can project yourself onto the character way easier when you're literally in that surrounding. When you are the character in that point. Exactly. Definitely. And I think uh, Resident Evil is on some of the forefront of that where they created a whole game just around the idea of you being in VR when you're playing the game. Do you think that... What, what are you guys' thoughts as far as horror goes with VR and how what aspects they may be utilizing right now well or may want to consider utilizing that they're not currently doing. Well, I think it's a beautiful idea in, in general having having that because I love horror games, horror movies. I love being scared. I love to hate it. It's weird because I hate being scared, but I love the feeling of being scared. Mm, kind of like roller coasters in that way. I think we had a whole episode about like why the psychology of horror. Yeah. Um, my mom was on that episode, and I think it was like – we talked about why do people like to be scared? Is it is it some sort of like a primal thing in us, or does it make us feel better with the fact that we can be scared and that's fun because now it takes the fear out of it when it's actually like a scary situation? I wonder if it's that adrenaline release because watching yeah, it play. like it was so uncomfortable for me. I that was the only movie I wanted to leave, but I was having so much fun watching it. It's such a mixed feeling. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Derek? Um, basically with horror VR, I think it's going to be a lot more intense, kind of like Pevin was saying. I mean, when you're controlling that character yourself, it's a lot more intense for you because you're not thinking about the outside the box stuff. You're just kind of focused on what's happening around you. And I think like Steve was saying that with the VR aspect, you can actually add more elements that you wouldn't really have. Like, I think the sound is going to be key. You can actually add sounds kind of in the back base of it. And with the background sounds, you can actually make it a little more effective and more horror aspect. What about VR in general? How do you think that will change? Right now, it's like a, a, a headset that you put over your your eyes primarily. Do you think it's going to, to evolve to have earphones as well? I think, doesn't like the HTC already do that? I, yeah. I, I think they all, most of the VR headsets come with headphones attached to them. Yeah, it's kind I of already there. Right yeah. I, th I think audio might become more of a key factor, you know, coming up. But uh, I mean, yeah. 
I think audio is already a really good factor in horror games right now because I've played some games where if you have a good set of headphones on, you're hearing stuff behind me. I've taken the headphones off because I've thought there's been someone in my house and it's like, oh, it was the game. And, you know, adding that to with VR, I haven't experienced it yet, but I can only imagine that like visually, like you see something out of the corner of your eye and now you got to be like flicking around trying to see what's going on or maybe taking your glasses off or freaking out because the couch touched you. Right. Or maybe like you hear a steady thump, like, you know, thump, thump, you thump, just, and your headphones is like, oh, shoot, what's around the corner? Can you imagine having your cat jump on your lap in like a really <laughs> intense scene? And you just... <laughs> <laughs> I, so I was I was thinking, what if it was like a motorcycle helmet? So you had more space to put like all of the graphical capabilities and you could create VR in much higher graphic ab- abilities and you it would completely encase you so that like you feel like you're more in it. I feel like when you have a, at least when you have goggles on, you can still connect with the outside world. But if you were completely surrounded in a space, you would be able to delve deeper in mentally. I don't. I so I. I think it's how well the goggles are fitted because I don't think it matters if it's a motorcycle helmet. It depends on if you can see the edges of the goggles or if you can see outside. If if all you see is what you see, it doesn't matter. And if you expose yourself to long of that, you're gonna get lost in that world. Is, is my thoughts. I was gonna bring up the point. There's a this professional pool player, and these people made a virtual pool game, and they ha- they invited him over to play pool. And the dude, you know, it took him like five minutes to get used to it, and. After five minutes, he tried to lean on the table and fell flat on his face. I saw that. Like, he was completely convinced he was playing pool. He tried to lean on the table that didn't exist and just ate it. That's wild. So, they're doing Dang. a pretty good job already convincing pros that they're actually playing pool when they're playing virtual pool. Yeah. I had a point about where the technology might go, because we, we talked about how it would add to horror games. But I think an unexpected avenue that it'll open up is with role-playing games. So, things like kind of, uh, like let's say World of Warcraft, but maybe not in a... Uh, in a first-person perspective. I mean, not in the third person, but in the first-person perspective. Because the big issue we have with role-playing games right now is people do metagaming. So they're essentially just playing... They're not playing a character. The character is just the appearance, but there's no like actual role-playing involved. It's just like they are just being themselves with this thing is trying to get the maximum stuff. But if you put someone fully in that environment and it feels like they're actually there... They're gonna become like these other kind of kind of people. Like they're gonna become the people who they want to play, and people will be doing more of a role play in that kind of environment. I think so. I think that's one unintended kind of outcome that might happen. You get people pretending to be other people online. Like like I'm not just like this guy playing a knight. I am a knight in this world. Have any of you guys seen the VR chat thing? Yes, yes. So that's what I'm kind of because that way, like your hands move, like in the game, your hands are moving, so it almost like makes it so anything the your body does in the game your body's actually doing in real life so it like copies your motion i've never played it but it's kind of interesting yeah it, it that, that one's pretty interesting because people do act like kind of interesting in that uh oh god i just got reminded of uh the meme that came from that it's like uh, what show was me it? the way you should, follow yeah. me my brothers <laughs> yeah. what was it called ugandan ugandan knuckles ugandan knuckles oh my god <laughs> show me the way this is not the way my brothers <laughs> It's the, uh, this is the queen. <laughs> Spit down the non-believers. <laughs> Steve and Derek are just yeah, like, I'm what, what is right he? <laughs> I, think, I think I've seen this in passing like before it was meme Go. quality. Like. I saw it when it first came out. It was hilarious. I lost it. <laughs> it's probably my favorite meme this out there. This is the way, my brothers. <laughs> so I, I want to look, look past VR a bit and see what you guys' thoughts are as far as even more forward, where do you see the video game technology going? What do you think that there's styles of games that will grow in popularity, some that will fall, and where the technology might take us? Right now, we're getting as immersed as possible. Is there a sort of online style that we could get to where we're literally jacked into the game? What What are you guys' thoughts as far as, as any of that's concerned? The I future. See, I see them becoming more accessible because. It's it's for me. It's like uh, people don't play video games very often. Like a good portion of the population now does. More and more girls are playing since it's been less stigmatized. It used to be like a stigma, like oh that's what that's what nerds play, but now it's less and less of a thing. So there's more, you know, say girls playing. There's more like mothers playing games, but it's more like Farmville. Like my mom plays lots right. of Farmville and that kind of stuff. But I think the video game landscape will expand and expand as people just come more accustomed to it. Like now. When kids are growing up, they're just playing video games naturally. You know, they're playing it with their siblings or with their, their parents. And so I think it's going to be more widespread, and there'll be a lot more divergence as far as 
material available for games. I think this whole shitty uh, pay-to-play kind kind of stuff, or pay-to-win, that's going to be more prevalent, but there'll be a counter-reaction to that where it's going to be lots of good content. So you have lots of shit mixed with lots of, you know, uh, good stuff. So I, I think that's where video games are going. Uh, let's go with Derek next. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that a lot of people are getting in even younger now. I mean, any game you get onto multiplayer now, you're going to find, like, 10-year-olds, like, talking to, and it's like, um... Do you really even know what you're doing? I mean, so it, it's kind of horrible sometimes, but some of them are actually fairly knowledgeable, which I'll give them credit. But, um, but yeah, I think I agree with you that it's definitely going that way in the future where it's going to be more accessible. And I think eventually it's going to be all online where there's probably not going to be consoles anymore. You're just going to have, you know, some adaptation where you don't have to use a console anymore. It's just, you know, you plug like a little USB stick into your TV or something and they're ready to go. So I think it's going to be going in that direction because it seems like it's going more access and just more availability to players with, you know, less cost for the developer. Or if the TV is the console. I could see that too, yeah. I could see something I mean, look at the Switch. That basically is your answer right there. It's it's a screen, it's a game console, it's portable, it's big. So, I mean, we're, we're getting there. And I think VR, back to Steve's question, is probably going to open up the sandbox worlds that way, like, you know, Grand Theft Auto or uh, No Man's Sky. Like, I feel like those games would be so much better with VR, where No Man's Sky kind of flopped. I didn't really play it, but I understand it was like just vast, open, boring worlds. But I think in a VR world, and you can really explore and you're much more involved in it, I think that could kind of be fun for some people who aren't really hardcore gamers and just want to, you know, maybe explore hypothetical nature out in space and stuff like that. You know, Sky, Skyrim would be amazing to explore I would VR. love Skyrim VR. That would be the best experience ever, honestly. It's kind of the problem I have with like games in general. I just do too much exploring. And if I had a VR, I would just you know look at every nook and cranny. Like, oh, hey, there's like a apple pie in here. Oh, hey, there's this. Oh, well, right. well, these fires are over here. That's interesting. I wonder why. It'd just, it'd just be like that instinct there. No, yeah, games like that, I've had a lot of situations where I... You know, throw five, six hours in the game, and it's like, oh, I did one quest. It's like, oh, what <laughs> yeah. was I doing this whole time? <laughs> I can remember speaking of that, like just looking around. I remember me and Steve were playing the new Duke Nukem game. Well, I guess not new. It's like ten years old now. And the opening scenes, there was like these two hot babes sitting next to you. But me and Steve are looking at the ceiling, going, "This room is built very poorly. There's no airflow. <laughs> they should really put some fans over here." And we're like discussing the structure of this building <laughs> instead of like looking at the attractive women next to Duke Nukem. Oh, I only vaguely remember that, but it sounds accurate. <laughs> yeah. It sounds accurate. Where do you think video games are going, Steve? To answer your own question, I, I have I have no idea. I think a very interesting aspect that okay, so the ultimate game is life. <laughs> so if you can take the intricacies that make the Earth and recreate it on a video game. See, now you're getting you can have the, second life. You're getting into the simulation theory right now, Stephen. That already exists, and I think Stephen Hawking talks about that, where we might theoretically already be living in one of these. We might not mm-hmm. know it. We might be NPCs for someone who's playing this world. We think we're all individuals. We think we have our own lives, but we're just really developed computer programs. I'm thinking of it more like, like a Matrix scenario, where we're all real people, but we're jacked into the game, and we don't even realize it. But let's say that you could you could pay, pay a, an amount of money and get jacked into this game and you're literally on life support in real life, but you're completely in this game. You don't even remember real life and you go from being a baby and an accelerated speed through an entire life. You live an entire life in say a year of your real life, six months of your real life. And then you come out of that experience back into the real world. And then you jump out of a building because like, you don't know what's real anymore. You're and like, then... holy shit. Like, that would be the ultimate game. It's kind of like that thing on Rick and Morty, right? It's just like... Well, yeah, it sounds like Inception. And Morty. Yeah, I think kind of like you are saying, I think it would really screw you up. Because, it I mean, would? after you get out of that for six months, you're not going to know what's real and what isn't real. So, But, I mean, there's people who get screwed up on regular video games right that now. True. That, like, there's people who get screwed up on Avatar. Like, they're, like, they got so connected with a world that doesn't exist. But I think that this would be an, a much higher experience. This would be, like, this is next level. This is, like, pinnacle shit. So, speaking on what Steve just said, there's this idea that in the future we're – we're working right now being able to download our minds, right? So we can create a digital clone of ourselves to save on a computer. So when you pass, there's always a, you know, a version of you living. So there's predictions that maybe, you know, 
200 whatever years in the future, we all might be living in this electronic world instead of the physical world, because now we can live, we can be 25 forever in this virtual world that looks exactly like the real world. And it's our exact, you know, personality uploaded into this. And so who's not to say the human race, you know, turns into more of a computer algorithm. And then we just, I don't, it just seems weird. Like we could be living on machines in the future because we find life inside this digital world we created better and easier than this life out here where we can terrible things happen to you. Mm-hmm. No, I could definitely see that because um, I don't know if anyone's seen the TV show Black Mirror, mm-hmm. but there was, was actually an episode of that that they uploaded the mind into the like a robot. And basically the robot was kind of like the same exact thing as the person, just not a real person. So I could see something like that. They also, did you see the Star Trek one? Well, it was like Star Trek clone. I didn't where see that one, but. He actually, this guy made a really good virtual reality world. And then he basically cloned all of the people he hated in the real world on his ship. And he was the commander of the ship. And the, I'm not going to get into the episode, but basically you'd sit down and he'd like plug in kind of like the Matrix and he'd go play this game. And then when he wants to get out, he unplugs and then poof back in the real world. See, for me, where the uh, uploading consciousness gets a little bit strange is like there's an idea of POV consciousness versus like uh, so there's like your consciousness right here. Let's say you you know to do a download of your brain and then you still, still keep living. So that downloads there. And let's say they activate that download. That's a separate consciousness than yours. So your consciousness doesn't get you know, transferred in. If you die, you're died. Like, that's just a separate you there. Same exact personality, same exact everything. So there would have to be a way for me, because it's like, sure, I can keep living in a way. People won't know any different than me, but it is different than me. That's not my consciousness. That's another separate consciousness. So that's where, that's where it gets kind of confusing. Have I, we ever had an episode where we didn't talk about consciousness? I mean, no. no. <laughs> the 90s one. I didn't hear that one. <laughs> It was implied. You are now entering a zone of sight and sound. <laughs> but that, I think that's the big problem because the people where you want to like, uh, people have to really think they're important to uphold their consciousness. I mean, maybe if there's brain damage or something, there's a way to repair it with yourself, but that, that's where it gets complicated. But I think people would want to see other people's consciousness. Like, let's say there's a George Carlin out there or another like famous comedian. It's like, yeah, we definitely need to preserve this person's brain here because, or an Einstein, you know. Because cause we need them to keep doing what they're doing in this virtual world. Whereas, you know, if yourself, unless there's a way to transfer your consciousness into the computer and keep it intact, y- you're going to die anyway. It doesn't save you. Yeah, I mean, I think they've played around in some movies already with, like, the idea of actually being alive in the game. There's two movies I can think of off the top of my head. There's one called Stay Alive, where if you die in the game, then you die for real. Mm-hmm. And basically, if you die in the game, that's how you die. And there's another one called Gamer, where... Basically, these inmates, yeah, these inmates were actually hooked up, and basically, if they survived, I think it was like twelve games in a row. If they survived twelve games in a row, they'd be freed. But there's actually a human player playing the real person as like a video game NPC. Complex. Remember when my headphones worked? Uh, anyway, I was gonna say no, no they just broke in half. What did you so, do? So this is weird. But I was, <laughs> what did you? Do? They're literally held together with like six different sets of tape. It's like and Nate's like, game. what did you do? It's like Tommy Boy. It was his consciousness exploded. It. I was gonna say, remember when this conversation started with Steve talking about joysticks? Oh, I remember. And now we're getting real deep. So real deep, my deep headphones the, couldn't take it. Real <laughs> deep in the joystick. I'm melting off my face. I think we need to like talk about joysticks a little more. So, what's your favorite kind of joystick? Mine. Ah, uh, the nipple. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever use one of those? I forget what you call it, but it's like a like like it's one of the big ones where it has like all the triggers and stuff. It's and like a jet, whatever those jet control yeah, like things the flying are. ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah cause I, I used one of those and it was kind of fun. Like I had its tank game and it was made for the tank game and also the airplane game that came with it and. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't see those anymore now. Let's talk about the N64. I was just going to say that is beautiful (laughs) because that invented the joystick. In theory, people are like, oh, no, Atari did. Atari wasn't a true joystick. But so the N64, the way it works is much different than modern joysticks. Now they're all like, I don't know how to compare them. But basically, they're they're on an axis and they track how far the joystick moves. So the N64, there's two separate gears, one that goes up and one goes left and right. And so in combinations, wherever the joystick is, it's going to move these two gears up and down, left and right on the X and Y axis. And it will then map that to the controller and tell the game where you're turning or not turning. And so that's why you get this floppy joystick syndrome with N64 controllers, because as you play it, you actually wear down those plastic gears on the inside that are holding the joystick still. And so it flops over sideways. I'm going to level a criticism against you, Nick, about floppy joysticks. 
So back in college, we'd go over to your your dorm and yes, we'd play. I'm sorry, you were player three. You got the floppy stick. And you always took the good. So you're you're amazing again. You're far better than me and Steve. Steve was a bit better than me, but I sucked. I sucked. But you always got the great joystick, and you just kill us, like just murder us. Like we had no chance. And- I'm, I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> At, I will tell you now, I've replaced all the gears and all of my N64 controllers, so they're all brand new and fresh and ready to go, and I'm sorry that I kept taking the good controller from you guys. I'm fine. I like the challenge. I, I did not like the challenge. I did not do well. <laughs> I just died over and over again. Yeah, I remember I think I owned one Hori Pad at that point, and basically the Hori Pad was like the GameCube controller for the N64, mm. so it was uh, a little unfair. I'm the, sorry. The, N- <laughs> the N64 had some interesting... Um, some interesting accessories that I, I don't think a lot of people know about. Nick, can you can you give us an example? Well, I know one of me and Steve's favorite is the the train accessory. I forget what that game was called. It's something in Japanese. Go. Densha de Go. Densha de Go, yeah. And it's it took me and Steve quite a while to figure out how to actually make the trains go and how to stop. I think it took us like like two or three hours just to beat level one. Yeah. I think you have to plug it into like controller port two or something. Oh yeah, it was like it had to be like four or something, and yeah. then you had to use the regular one to go through the menu. It's also one of only two games on the N sixty four that uses the microphone, and it's to welcome your passengers on board, and that's I it. Thought, <laughs> yeah, hey you Pikachu uses <laughs> that's it. That's the guess, only oh, other yeah. one. Welcome. Just those two. I remember you used to just scream obscenities at them, and they yep. just like <laughs> get like thirty <laughs> extra points. <laughs> you get points right yeah. Derek, do you know much about the N sixty four? Yeah, I definitely had an FX64 when I was younger, and I didn't have a lot of accessories for it. I mean, the only accessory I remember is the Rumble Pack, but yeah. besides that, that's the only accessory I know, but I definitely loved a lot of games on there. I mean, you had the 007 game. Mm-hmm. There's actually Beautiful. this game called... Um, yeah, game. I love that game. And there's actually probably a less known game that I used to love back then. It was called Destruction Derby. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, that, I love that bet. game. <laughs> That was mm-hmm. a very fun game. That is a fun game. I'll say, uh, do you know Nintendo was the first person to introduce a Rumble Pack? I think it's, oh, I think it's Star Ni- Fox. Mr. Nintendo? Mr. <laughs> Nintendo. Oh, Mr. Nintendo himself. Yeah. Did he bring it to your house and he's like, here you go, Nick, check out this. It hey, Nick, this is a Rumble Pack. Put, Rumble against pack your, put it against your dick. You're 13. This is what you're going to like. I was eight. Put on some perfect dark and let this bud boy rumble on Mr. Nintendo. Yeah. Where did this come from? <laughs> you said Nintendo was the first person. To introduce the Rumble Pack. Well, okay, maybe the first company. company. But... Well, what, okay. what does it have to do with the Rumble Pack? I'm a boss. I'm Steve. a comedian. What do you want from me? I don't understand the correlation. <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, I was going to uh, name this other random peripheral. It was the Tetris Sphere, I think it was called, for the or Tetris 64. It only came out in Japan, and it had this special heart rate monitor that you'd plug into Player 4, and you'd put it on your finger. And as your heart rate went up, the Tetris board would move faster and faster. And I think that's the only game that ever used that. And I don't even know how well that worked. I, I think there's one other game. I only know about this because I think the angry video game nerd, uh, he's on YouTube. Uh, but I think he did something with the heart rate monitor. Was That was something different. Because he was talking about weird accessories like the power glove and all these other ones. Um, that I know of, that's the only game that uses it on the Nintendo 64, at least. Uh, there's probably other systems that have Actually, a heart rate monitor. That might be what it is. Maybe it's a different game. Or a different system, rather. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it was, because they were, like, way ahead of their time with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, I didn't even think they had stuff like that back then, but apparently they did. I didn't either, and then I started getting into looking at Japanese shit, and let me mm. tell you, one of the weirdest games I've ever seen in history is on the N64... And it's called, um, fuck, what's it called? It's called Gitter Love. G-E-T-T-E-R. Gitter Love, yeah. Gitter Love, subtitle, Panda Love Machine. <laughs> and it's in Japanese. It's a dating sim for the Nintendo 64. I like the hamster racing one where you, okay, like, you, like, <laughs> you like raise hamsters like they're horses and you race them at the derby. That's yeah. an interesting Remember Japanese Remember the game. graphics on the horse racing game? That blew our mind when oh, we put oh, that Oh, yeah, in. it looks so good in 3D it for the N64. so good. It's like they rendered real horses. Dating sim games have gotten really big, I've realized. It's like a lot of people who play on Twitch and uh, YouTube, they will do these dating sim games. And it's like they get really into it. I, I'm not really sh- – like most of the ones I've watched are in Spanish because I'm trying to like learn Spanish a bit. But it, no, it's, it's because you like the look of the women. Well, yeah. I, okay. I, I, okay. I just want to keep you honest. <laughs> but it, it's also because they speak Spanish. I mean, it, it's, Yo, a it's, it's a combination. It's a combination. Combination. They're sweet asses. I don't know how you knew that. <laughs> well, obviously, Nate, it's you. <laughs> Fuck. But yeah, yeah. So there's all these like dating simulation type games. And it's like all these 
I, I don't even know what happens in these games, but they're all, like, from Japan. There's some American ones, and they're very popular. Derek, have you seen any of those? I haven't really. I mean, I, I've never had much experience with those games. I've heard of, like, you know, the more extreme ones, like Leisure Suit Larry and things like that, but... I don't think that was a dating game. I think that was a porn game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's what I was saying, more extreme. But, <laughs> so, I don't think you're trying to date anybody in that game. I think you're... <laughs> One was like Magna Suit Larry, Magna Cum Laude. It's like very... Yeah. The emphasis Nate has the collection in, in full remastered <laughs> HD on his computer. 4K <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry. Complete with VR goggles. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was one other peripheral that I don't think most people know about for the N64, and that is a fishing pole. It's an N64 controller mapped over like a fishing pole shape, and it has a little wheel and everything. And it's only compatible with a couple games. One of them is one by uh, the creator of Kirby. Is it Iwata? Is that his name? That sounds mm. Japanese. <laughs> Who created sounds, Kirby? Sounds, yeah. Well, whoever created it. <laughs> so he created this game, and you can play as like a bear. You can play as like these crazy characters. But one of the people you can play as is the creator of the game himself. So you can play as the creator of Kirby in the game. And there was an actual tournament where you could win money of this game. And he joined the tournament and played as himself in the game. It was the most wow. meta shit for the N64 <laughs> you could possibly imagine. So speaking of the fishing pole accessory, I saw I was watching an N64 Super Smash contest. And there was this one guy who was playing Smash Bros. And he was kicking butt and just to be, you know, just to rub it in their faces. Everyone goes, oh, no. Oh, no. He's reaching for it. And he pulls the fishing rod controller out of his bag and plugs it in and plays the match with it and wins. <laughs> He beats this this professional N64 Smash, and he beats him with a fishing rod accessory. That's amazing. That's a slap in the face. That is a fish slap right in the old face. So, favorite favorite console. I, I, I don't want to get too long in the tooth here, but I do want to know what you guys' favorite consoles are. Other than Nathan, because I know it's PC, and I don't want to hear it. <clears throat> PC Master Race. <laughs> I will say now PC is the best console, but for me, uh, the N64 is just so nostalgic. That's the system I grew up with. I had so many great memories with that game, going over to friends' houses, you know, playing local four-player LAN, like, just a great time. Even in college, we played a lot of Smash Bros., Mario Party, Diddy Kong Racing. Like, it was just a big part of most of my life. Even I mean, now, probably 90% of my gaming is done on PC, but I think the N64 is always going to hold its place in my heart. Yeah, I think for me, I probably have to say the same thing, but... I mean, the Super Nintendo was right up there with me, too, because that's what kind of got me into gaming. I mean, Donkey Kong Country was probably one of the first games I really loved. So I think it would be Super Nintendo's pretty close up there, but N64 had a lot of games I loved, and that kind of started my whole gaming path, I would say. Uh, ColecoVision. No. Uh, so you're making stuff like, you, what game you play on ColecoVision? Donkey Kong? Uh, Death Star. That's probably a game. <laughs> no, that sounds, there's, like <laughs> tons, like, there's tons of uh, space, space games. Shoot. I bet that's one. Space shoot. Space shoot. Space shoot. The game. Yeah, yeah. you go around in you dungeons. Shoot space and at people. No, no, this is a dungeon crawler. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably the Super Nintendo or the N sixty four. One of those two. Um, I've played. I played a shit ton of the PlayStation. Um, in that back in that same time. So like that's right up there with them. The the original PS one. Um, but I mean like all all the systems that I've played have been so good. So it's. A lot of it comes down to the third-party support, the video games that go along with it. But I think Nintendo has such an edge there because the, every game Nintendo released as a publisher was just fucking amazing. See, I feel left out of this Nintendo loop because when I was growing up, I grew up with the Sega Genesis, which I did enjoy quite a lot. There's uh, games, Sonic Adventure 2, which I played a lot of, and some other great games. But I didn't really you ever... You can only name one. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there were games. Space <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> yeah <laughs> two but the they had a lot of street fighter stuff i wasn't very no. good at video games back then my family was kind of poor so it's it's like some of the games we had i couldn't get past the first level uh sonic was kind of one of those or i got like some ways into it but uh i only got introduced to nintendo when the gamecube came out or is after it was out for a while and then i got the gamecube and then after the ps2 was already out we got the playstation but the I'm not as familiar with Nintendo as other people are. We'll just put a Nintendo sticker on your PC and we'll call it good. Okay. <laughs> Nintendo Master Race. <laughs> Speaking of Nintendo, like it's kind of sad to see where they've fallen. Cause, I mean, they used to have such a hold on the market back then. And now it's kind of like Nintendo's just really an afterthought. So 
Uh, it is kind of sad for me in a way, but I think they're coming back with the Switch. They've done a great thing. The Wii U was a tank console, and I know the Switch already in its first year sold more than the Wii U did in its entire life. But I think the Switch is doing a great thing, where Nintendo is now merging mobile gaming with home gaming, and I honestly think that's the way they're going to go. They're probably going to remove their their DS line, their handheld line, and they're just going to continue to make consoles like the Switch, where it's like you go home, you plug it in the dock, and you play. You don't want to like with me when I go in the airport all the time. I bring my Switch with me, and it's great because I have you know a game that I can play for six hours, and it's a pretty good, you can play some pretty good games on that. Like, Fortnite's on there. It plays pretty well. I mean, obviously not as good as it would on other consoles, but Nintendo's getting up there. They're releasing, like, the new Wolfenstein 2 game on it. They're surprisingly powerful little console. The Bit Wars was really the only time that Nintendo actually cared about graphics being, like, their main sticking point. But as soon as, like, N64 era ended and it went into modern consoles, like, they they stopped caring about graphics and started just caring about gameplay and i think they really created their niche and in in the market by zoning in on families and and family games and i think that they did and they've done an awesome job in doing so while still providing a couple of different games that will appeal to to avid gamers or, or more mature gamers as people would call them now like the blood free version of street fighter 2 yeah, just like that. Well, I mean, Mortal Kombat, not Street Fighter 2. My bad. Let me just... Yeah, the blood-free version. Yeah, I can put it in a code, Nick. So we'll do one last question, then we'll wrap it up. We're about 50 minutes here. All right. What's the biggest dick you've ever seen? Um, Mine, because it's the only one. <laughs> you've never seen another dick? No. That's what? I've seen like 700. 700 <laughs> dicks? All right, let's go to a real question now. I, I What's the big... Oh, okay. Uh, so a question I want to ask to wrap it up here is, what game are you most excited for in the future? A new release that's going to happen soon or in the future. Nick? I was just going to say, I actually haven't seen 700 dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Nick, we all estimate low sometimes. <laughs> okay, so uh, back to the, the point. Is that here. your favorite upcoming game, 700, <laughs> 700 dicks? 700 dicks and one. You are a samurai and you must paddle through <laughs> Night of 700 dicks. The forest of dicks. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Half Life Three—that's the game I'm most excited about. Yeah, never it's, gonna happen. I know it's never gonna happen yeah. now because all the story writers—they already wrote stories out. There's like two finished stories for Half Life Three. There's even Half Life Two Episode Three. But most of those people have left Valve, or Valve has moved all their money over because now Valve makes so much money on Steam they don't need to make games anymore. We're gonna start a GoFundMe <laughs> called called Seven Hundred Dicks. Kidnap Gabe Newell. <laughs> And we're going to take Gabe, and we're going to put him in the basement, and we're going to say, Half-Life 3 or no, you're going to die. And gun to his head, he's going to have to make it by himself. And then it's going to suck, and we're going to be like, we did it. Good job, guys. So that's the other thing I'm worried about. It's been so long. There's so much hype about the oh, game. It, it could never live up to that. I mean, because there's a, there a good 10-year gap between Half-Life and Half-Life 2, and Half-Life 2 was amazing. And so it's been a good, like... 10, maybe 15 now between Half-Life 2 and Hypothetical 3. I know they trademarked Half-Life 3 and Left 4 Dead 3, but that doesn't mean anything. All it means is we owe him a lot of money right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go where Steve next. What's your most anticipated game? Um, I don't I don't know. I didn't watch E3. I'm excited for Madden 19 um, because the graphics upgrade has been insane from what I've heard. I've, heard, I've seen... Um, there's a, a popular podcast called uh, Three Player Co-op, and on that recently they were talking about um, he got a one of the exclusive codes to actually check out the game, and like he said, playing that game like he plays 18 all the time. He's actually hosts a league, TPCFL.com. Check it out. But uh, in the comparison in games, he said it's like it's like watching an actual football game if you're watching somebody play that game. And the idea of, like, the graphics being that good are insane to me. I mean, I, I own a Scorpio and a 4K TV, so I have true 4K HD images. And so my excitement to watch a game like that where the graphic they put so much time into the graphics and the Frostbite engine so strong, I'm just really excited to see what, what's going to happen with, with graphics on a lot of these Xbox games coming up. Mm-hmm. Derek? Uh, for me, I'm kind of thinking more short term, I would say. I mean, since I mentioned I love the story games a lot, I'm thinking Life is Strange 2. And I just played the Awesome Adventures Captain Spirit, which I think is a great prelude for that. And I'm really excited what they're going to do with that game. I keep seeing people play Life is Strange. Like, uh, it's a popular Let's Play game. And is it, it, is, is yeah. it really that good? Honestly, I think so. I mean, 
it's probably Telltale's only competitor at all in that kind of genre, but I really think they do a great job with it. And I know the Captain Spirit game that just came out, there's actually like one moment in that that's like really gut wrenching and actually really hits you when it happens. I won't spoil what it is, but so so those games are like console point and click. Pretty much, yes. I mean, but what I love about it is it just lets you make your own story because your choices actually matter later on. So when you make a choice later on, you're not going to know how that's going to affect you, but it will affect you later on. Like, I won't spoil the story for Captain Spirit, but I mean, basically some of the choices you make at the end, you can kind of see how they might play out in Life is Strange 2. Mm. So like you, you do a thing and then it's like, Cap- Captain will remember this. Um, that's more Telltale. I, I haven't seen oh, that as much in uh, the Life is Strange series, but the Telltale one, it definitely says, you know, this person will remember this. And like going back to The Walking Dead real quick, I know like in season one of that, if you like pissed off certain characters, then they wouldn't actually accompany you on the rest of the game afterwards. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Nathan, what game are you most excited for? Probably Cyberpunk 2077. Um, it's from my favorite developer, CD Projekt Fred, and I don't think they are going to produce a bad game. Also, they had an E3 uh, demo. It was closed doors, and uh, like the people who went to that demo, that screening, got super, super hyped, like beyond hyped. Uh, they said it's like the best game that they saw of that year. So that game's like maybe two or three years from being released, it seems. So it's going to be a while still, but... I'm still very excited to play that game once it arrives. And it's from CD Projekt Red, so I think it's going to be really good. Well, that's awesome. So I, I think we all have uh, – we've all kind of explained a lot about, like, what we like and what we um, you know, what we see coming in the future. I think it's a really exciting time. And as gra- some people really love graphics. Some people really love gameplay. Some people really love story. And I think all three of those come together in certain games and really, like, enrich uh, our, our lives as a whole. Um, and, and can, I mean, I've had games that have completely like changed my perspective on life. It's, it, I think games have changed my life as it currently stands. And I, I hope that continues. And I think VR is going to be a unique opportunity to do that. Steve is now Batman. I'm a little bit of Batman, just enough. Now, if you want to hear more about video games, you should definitely check out Derek's podcast. Where can they find you, Derek? They can find me on Twitter at blaze experience. Or you can send me an email, theblazeexperience at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And you're on Podcast and H? Yes, I am. Excellent. And the Blaze Experience is spelled uh, XP, like, yes, like experience, there's... and then Erian. Right. I did that on purpose because XP for gaming, obviously. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I thought no that was way. very clever, yeah, and, and it makes it really easy to remember. Right. <laughs> we'll put the link in the description. So if you don't want to like, you know, Google and stuff, you know, just look in the description of the podcast and you'll find it there and of course one of the easiest places to find him is where you can find us as well podcastnh.com uh check it out and there's a ton of other podcasts on there as well if you like gaming if you like this episode i highly highly suggest the blaze experience thanks for coming on there thank you appreciate it nick you're here too yeah and, and if you want to look for me thanks to the shadow guys i'll be hiding in the bush outside your house That's that where sounds, I can be found. So that don't, sounds have, don't have to google me just knock on the window and i'll see you knock on the window in the bush <laughs> my bush knock on his bush window yeah. <laughs> he'll be playing 700x <laughs> oh boy hey nick hey, hey steve we need to talk <laughs> <laughs>